was top top of the of the world. Uh, felt great, amazing. And then I had some issues with my foot, which led to surgery and stuff, but, uh, which then put me back down a little bit. Uh, however, I learned from the past year that life is kind of like a roller coaster, and you have to be ready for the dips because if you're not ready, kind of keep going down. And but you also have to appreciate those hard times because without the hard times, you the good times won't feel as good. Um, and you also learn your biggest lessons during those hard times. Put in the work, it all speak for itself. Grinding and sound ain't nothing to tell. When we step on the court, we gon' bring it to light. And we stop and pop like we caught it a light. Stop asking what's wrong with me. You already know there's a dog in me. And yeah, there's no stopping my focus, man. Make sure all my people gon' ball with me. Yeah, I came to compete, I'm a dog with it. Yeah, I came to compete with my paws in it. Uh. What's up, Compete Training Academy family? Welcome back to the Compete Mentality Podcast. Compete Mentality Podcast exists to motivate, educate, and inspire you guys to compete. Our definition of competing is doing what God calls you to do, even when it's hard. And today, ladies and gentlemen, I am super fired up today, extra fired up, because I'm with my brother from another mother, Will Bird. Will, thanks for joining us today, my man. What's up? Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm so excited for this to sit down. No doubt, no doubt. And Will and I, man, we we uh we go back, man. We started training together this year, and really, Will, it was a connection from the from the get go that we were able to share as uh at training together on the court. But then, just as we dove into the mindset side of things and really just started understanding like who you are, what you're about. Um, I'm super excited to dive into your story today and uh, how it's going to inspire everyone listening to this. And we're going to continue our series called tell me your story. So we all learn from people's stories and Will Berg, he's a very successful basketball player for the, the Purdue men's basketball team. And when you look at successful people like Will, it, it, it uh, I think there's a very common misconception that, you know, he ain't got no problems. He ain't been through nothing. Uh, he's he's he, he's not going through anything. And it's actually the exact opposite. Isn't that right, Will? Yeah, you have a unique set of issues that you face every single day as a basketball player at this level. And all the small problems that you, not normal, but the people that don't have the opportunity and the blessings that I have are kind of doubled and tenfold because every time those small issues pop up, you're constantly questioning yourself, why am I feeling this way? I've been so incredibly blessed with this opportunity. Why Why am I having these thoughts? Why am I not being able to perform? And etc. It's everything becomes 10 times better, but also sometimes 10 times worse as well. Mm, I, I, that's a good analogy right there, Will. We're going to dive in more into your story, but before we do, this is extra special because Will is actually in Stockholm, Sweden right now as we speak. Uh, so it's one o'clock here in Indiana right now. What time is it uh, where you're at, Will? So it's six hours ahead, so it's 7 p.m. Okay. right now. Okay, cool. And dinner he, time. He's uh, gracious to join on the podcast right before dinner. Here, he's about to have a family dinner, so we'll dive right in, Will. But just to kind of start us off, uh, we love talking about food on the podcast. So, like, if you're if I'm coming to <laughs> Stockholm to visit you to train, and uh, you're going to take me to get it to get a nice dinner, or maybe it's the family dinner that you're about to have. What's like this the the staple over there in Sweden, man? <clears throat> Swedish cuisine is quite special. We like hearty food, so mashed potatoes, potatoes in general, lots of stews. Yeah, you of course can't forget about Swedish meatballs, of course. Uh, they always hit home, and especially when my dad makes them, they're so so good. So if you were to come to Stockholm and we're training and stuff, I would force you to come back and 
have a different miles and eat some Swedish meatballs for sure. That nothing beats them. And if if you have ever tasted Swedish meatballs at like an IKEA or something, my dad's meatballs blow them out of the house. It's they're so good. Yeah. I, I love to hear that. A little a little uh touch from home. That's uh that's fantastic. I'm definitely gonna have to take you up uh, take you up on that, put that on my bucket list to train Will yeah. in Sweden and get some Swedish meatballs <laughs> afterwards. So for sure. Uh Will, uh super excited to dive into your story, like we said. And um as I mentioned earlier, that when people look at you, they may see Will Berg, the successful basketball player. But I wanna kick off you telling us a story about a time you went through adversity and how uh, you used it for good. Um, there's been some really cool articles come out on you recently and some fundraisers that we're going to dive into here as the podcast goes on. But share with us a story about a time that you've really had to battle some adversity. So I'll probably talk about a little bit more of a recent one. Uh, so there's always issues going on in everybody's life. Uh, but when I took the big, big leap of moving across the world to the States, um, I kind of wasn't expected to face so much challenge as I was was about to, uh, especially doing practices and lifting and everything. I thought, I, honestly, I thought I was more ready than I was showing up to college. Uh, so when I show up there at campus, starting to practice with everyone uh, and have to play against the national player of the year every single day. It's kind of hard for you mentally to prepare for that, uh, especially when he's a 7-4 dude that's got like... Um, so at the beginning of the season, I kind of started to lose myself a little bit, I would say. Um, Lost my confidence in my ability, which then ref reflected negatively on my game, uh, leading to me performing worse. Uh, which, yeah. But the good thing about Purdue and the team and everything is that I had people, I was surrounding myself with people that supported me. And even though I was struggling a lot, I still had a lot of support from my friends and from my teammates and from people like Jordan, who are like family to me. Uh, so, during those rough patches, I injured my hand in the beginning of the year. Uh, kind of gave me a second to cool down a little bit, kind of calm down and like assess the situation. Uh, and then I started, I got set in stone that I was going to redshirt. So that kind of helped uh, with planning and stuff. And then practice started, uh, doing stuff again. Uh, I was practicing every single week with Jordan, uh, which I was, thank you for that. It helped so much, both mentally and uh, on the court. Um, just putting in those extra hours every single <laughs> morning like that. It was, it was great. Um, and I was actually feeling a turning point and like I was bad, good resistance. I was performing well and everything uh, was top, Top of the of the world, uh, felt great, amazing, and then I had some issues with my foot, which led to surgery and stuff, but uh, which then put me back down a little bit. Uh, however, I learned from the past year that life is kind of like a roller coaster, and you have to be ready for the dips because if you're not ready, you kind of keep going down, and but you also have to appreciate those hard times because. Without the hard times, you, the good times won't feel as good. Um, and you also learn your biggest lessons during those hard times. This yeah. past past year, I noticed some bad habits rise when, when I'm in a bad mental headspace and made sure to work on them and almost removed them completely from my life, which I'm thankful for. With the help of of Jordan as well. You helped me a lot with all our I am statements, um, putting that confidence back in me. I feel like that, that was crucial for, for my mental health during the year. And I'm I'm so so thankful for all that. Well, I love that story, Will. And um 
I can't wait to see how uh, you're going to use that adversity to propel you to even greater things here next year and for your the, the years to come in your basketball career. This is a highly talented young man uh, on the court, but an even better person off the court. And Will's best days are ahead of him, no doubt. But Will, uh, there's another uh, – it's, 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 it's a really awesome story that I want you to dive into. Um, you have a fundraiser going on that we want to talk about uh, for a not-for-profit that I want you to give us a little insight on. Tell us about it. So I've been battling type 1 diabetes my whole life. Uh, uh, my dad has it as well. My aunt has it. So it's in the family, basically. Um, always been like it, it's a challenge uh, juggling a lot of balls at the same time, basketball, school, and then on top of that, having diabetes and all that it makes stuff pretty hard. Uh, so let me pause, as I said, let me pause my dad, you there for a second. Yeah. So, like, for those of you who don't know what type 1 diabetes is and how it affects you, literally, you can't get away from it. It's every hour of the day. Will, just kind of walk somebody through how diabetes affects your day-to-day living. So, when you're type 1 diabetic, it means that your body has lost the ability to produce insulin. Insulin is the hormone that the body produces every time you eat something and which controls your glucose levels in the body, uh, your blood sugar. Uh, and f- the blood, if your blood sugar is erratic or low or high, it doesn't only affect you feel, but also your physical ability. Uh, having too low of a blood sugar, you can pass out. Uh, you get almost to the point where you're almost a little bit manic, um, kind of having wide swings of your emotion, acting irrational and stuff like that, which has no place on a basketball court. Um, and if you get hot, your body starts to take damage. Um, you get brain fog. Uh, you just feel super bad, get nauseous and headaches and all that stuff. Also not optimal if you want to perform on the court. Uh, so to that, uh, I have a glucose monitor on my arm uh, that continuously monitors my glucose for me and then tells my phone about it. Uh, and then I can check my blood sugar uh, levels all the time. I start the day by taking a shot of insulin. That's kind of like a baseline, uh, which helps me keep it a little bit more controlled. And the time I eat or every time I can feel that my blood sugar is not where it's supposed to be, I manually inject insulin as well with an insulin pen. Uh, This means that I constantly have to find what I'm putting into my body, what I'm eating, uh, when I'm eating. But the thing with insulin is that, and diabetes, the hormone. So even if I sleep bad or if I'm stressed or if I'm depressed or in a bad mental state, that can affect my blood sugar as well. So it's kind of a big cog in the whole in your whole body, and without it, a lot of things can get this. Yeah. yeah. And going back to where I started talking about my story and all of that, I've had diabetes since I was seven years old, um, and growing up with it, I kind of don't know what I'm missing out on living a normal life without diabetes. So it's kind of a day to day thing for me, a, a routine. Uh, but at the same time, it's been hard. I kind of getting learning myself, I guess, how I react to things, and just getting you can, you're forced to grow up really quickly when you get diabetes, uh, and you face a lot of predetermined thoughts about the disease, such as I got a lot of the kids when I was a smaller, like ten, twelve years old, that started calling me bad names that I was fat or I wasn't sporting enough because I had diabetes and they thought, yeah, you ate too much sugar and all that. And that's not a super good thing to hear as a 10, 12 year old kid. Um, But then I just pushed through it with the help of my dad. Uh, My dad is a blessing to me. Uh, Single dad, he's been 
yeah, a role model for me. Um, if I am a tenth of of the man that he is, I'm happy. Um, and him, him just like educating me on the disease and on self respect and respecting others. Uh, it's just helped me push through all the all the shit talk that gets thrown at you from all those those silly people. Uh, but growing up with it, it's always been like a little bit of a challenge. But it, it gets easier the more time you have the disease. Uh, even though it sucks seeing all your friends eating all that good, tasty fast food and sugars and all that, uh, you kind of have to hold back and all that stuff and be responsible about it. Yeah, and Will, that thank you for that. That's a that's a huge, uh, very vulnerable, insightful look on what it's like to go through on a day-to-day basis and i hope you guys listening you're encouraged by by will's story and now you can see uh kind of like i said at the beginning that it's not you see wilberg the successful basketball player but he goes through hard times on a day-to-day basis and he's fighting and he's working and he's growing and he's learning from adversity I like the analogy used as a roller coaster, the ups and the downs of the day-to-day, the ups and downs not only of basketball and the Big Ten, but the ups and downs of fighting through type 1 diabetes and fighting to keep your mind right and fighting to keep your spirit up. And sorry to interrupt you, but with my whole story and everything and my push for my so the the fundraiser that I'm pushing for here back in Sweden is called Born Diabetes Fund, which is basically means the Child Diabetes Fund, which is in charge of all of the diabetes research in Sweden. Uh, Sweden is one of, is is the second leading country in research of diabetes, with the U- U.S. being the first one. Uh, however, the U.S. and Sweden collaborate on a lot of things regarding diabetes, um, which also means that even if you donate to a fundraiser for uh, for a Swedish uh, organization, you're still contributing to the potential cure of it. Um, and if one place finds a cure for it, there's that's a cure for the whole world. Um, and that's also one of the important things I want to push is that even though diabetes is a really harsh and hard disease for for a kid or for a person, uh, that it's still possible to be successful and to achieve. Uh, it might it's only a little hill. To, it's a hill to get over, but you can still get over it as long as as you surround yourself with the right people and have the right mindset about it. Uh, everyone can push through this disease. Man, that is so good, Will. We like to say here at Compete Training Academy, if you're watching on YouTube, you see the barn right behind me. We, we say here at the barn, ain't no hill for a climber. Ain't no hill for a climber. And when you come to that hill, you just keep pushing. You keep climbing. You keep putting one step in front of the other, and you're going to get over that hill. And that is such an encouraging word from our man, Will Berg, here today about pushing through type 1 diabetes. Will, I want to transition a little bit to – and by the way, his fundraiser that he's doing is an unbelievable impact that's going to impact a lot of lives. We're going to put this fundraiser link in the show notes. So if you have, if you're touched by this story, if you're touched by what Will's going through, please donate. Um, at, at, and we'll have this link very accessible for you in the show notes. But Will, I want to hop into a little bit of Purdue basketball. We got a lot of Purdue fans listening uh, to this podcast that bleeds. Yes, sir. Lead golden black baby, and we can't wait to see you on the court. And um, just curious, as you've gotten to know the Big Ten, man, what's the arena that you believe is the hardest arena to play in? Obviously, the first one that springs to mind is uh, IU. Uh, it's a uh, the atmosphere there is just so incredibly toxic that it's like I couldn't believe the things that was were said to us when we ran into the court. Uh, but then at the same time, it's easier to filter those types of fans out because sorry for the bad choice of words, but that's just stupidity being shown. Like you, yeah, 
So I would probably say when we were at Nebraska or Northwestern, both those environments were so nuts. Uh, us being so highly ranked, I think that kind of fueled the fans a bit. And they were just screaming so loud. And those two arenas, Northwestern's arena is so small, but it's so compact that it's almost like Mackie. All the sounds get like amplified. Yeah. Uh, and Nebraska is just, it's a huge, huge spot. And it's like, the fans really, really support that team. Uh, so it's just, yeah, it's at the same time, it's kind of scary, but it's also really, really cool seeing that many people like cheering for one team and stuff. No doubt. I, I, uh, I, I can understand what you're saying. Uh, haven't, I didn't get to get the Nebraska game this year, but uh, Nebraska, man, there's nothing out there but the University <laughs> of Nebraska. And yeah. that whole state, man, shows out and supports, and that's a crazy environment. And I uh, this year was the first year that I went to a Purdue IU game at IU and definitely felt violated. Like, it was very intense atmosphere uh, there as well. Northwestern, I was there, and it was, uh, it was an intense game uh, up in Evanston. Uh, man, the, the heart of the Big Ten up in Chicago. So, uh, definitely uh, tough places to play. Will, yeah. uh, um, I'm curious, man, as uh, we got a lot of hoopers in here, uh, we talk a lot uh, that are going to be listening to this. We talk a lot about dreaming uh, here, at, here at Compete Train Academy and chasing your dreams and not um, – don't, don't – don't uh, – sell yourself short. Uh, there's, there's no dream that's too big. If you can dream it, you can do it. Hear me. If you're listening to this right now, if you can dream it, you can do it. I'm curious, Will, when did you believe at what age, like you're playing big time college basketball in the big 10, what age did you believe? Like I can do this. I can do this dream. So college has always been a big dream. Uh, I grew up, college basketball isn't that widely broadcast. It, you can't see it in Sweden that much. It's super hard. March Madness is basically the only time you're able to watch a game. Uh, but it was still the thing I was aiming for. Uh, so that's always been something that I've had in the back of my mind. And as I got older, I realized all the work I had to put in. Um, and then I was fortunate fortunate enough to have a body that fits a college basketball player too. So kind of when when that occurred in maybe the eighth, seventh grade, I realized that if I really put an effort in, I might have the chance. And if I if I'm fortunate enough for a coach to see me, I might have the chance to play college basketball. So that's, and that's as I got seventh or eighth grade. Seventh or eighth grade. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's young. Yeah. That's that's yeah. young to like believe that. Um, where would you say who instilled that belief in you at that age? My dad, for sure. Uh, he's the biggest supporter for me. Uh, and especially as him believing in me so much and putting so much faith in me. And we both kind of agreed that it was achievable. Um, I actually took a break before that time where I realized that it might be a possibility i took like a six month break from basketball because i was yeah it was a lot a big struggle during that period and i just had to focus on my mental health and then my dad pushed me to get back into the sport and reignited my love for the game um which then made me realize that even though i had been gone for six months i was still performing really good and i was like yeah i want to be able to move out of Sweden and push myself and chase my dream, um, which then made it me work harder, uh, develop my game, which gave me the opportunity to move like 12 hours away from Stockholm to a prep school in Sweden, which helped me um, build myself up physically, mentally, uh, technique-wise, gave me the opportunity to play with the national team, uh, which then caught the eyes of schools as Purdue, which boosted my recruiting and helped me find find my, my home today at, at, in West Lafayette. 
such an inspiring story. Listeners, keep dreaming big. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do something. Take encouragement from Wilberg's story. And I love hearing about his dad just encouraging him on and raising him the right way to believe in himself. Parents listening. Man, I I got a six-year-old and a four-year-old, and I'm taking notes over here on how to raise young minds. And I just think it's so cool of how Will's dad raised him to believe in himself that he could do it. And what, what an opportunity us as parents have on our child to help them chase their dreams. Uh, Will, uh, I, I want to I wanna ask, as, you, as you've dreamed and chased your dreams, um, when you were, you know, practicing growing up, was there a specific player that you pretended to be while you were working out? So my all-time favorite player that I like, like as a big man, I kind of have to say Shaq. It's like, but then at the same time, I I have, yeah, big diesel. I have a huge respect for Dirk and his game because I think that how he played and the way he played during that time period, revolutionary for for big men. And kind of why I have the ability to shoot is because Europe kind of helps all kids work on all, tech, all the part, different parts of basketball. We we don't put people into slots. We let everyone do everything, ball handling, shooting, whatever. So, And I was fortunate enough to have a great first coach called Christa Levin um, and Rolf Levin, which both, uh, they also prioritized everybody everybody's development over team success. Mm. which meant that all, all, all practices catered towards everyone instead of just focusing in on the star players of the team, which led to us having such a deep and connected team because nobody was like, of course, we had the alpha of the team, the star player, but then he had respect for everyone because everybody showed up and everybody worked hard. Uh, kind of, I think that kind of, ties into how we think at Purdue. Uh, we, we battled for each other. Everybody was diving on the floor, having each other's back, put, pouring their heart out on defense. And I think that's also one of the big reasons why when I had my visit to Purdue, uh, I kind of just fell in love with the place because I felt so much familiarity with my first team. It's the, the dog mentality and like the family Man, feel of it. That's right. That's right. Purdue basketball is all about being a family. Blue collar effort. Talking about things you can control. Will, man, thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. And I know you've been really gracious with your time. And listeners, go over. We'll put the link in the show notes. Go there right after this. Click the link. Support Will's foundation and that he's supporting and advocating for uh, to help with the research for type 1 diabetes. And Will, thank you so much. That was such a great insight to thank your you. story. So thank you. Absolutely. And and even if you're not fortunate enough to give a dollar or anything like that, just sharing, sharing it and reading up on diabetes is super crucial. Just having more knowledge about the disease helps a lot of kids. Help uh, removing all the predetermined thoughts about the disease and hopefully with all the pressure that all these kids are feeling and the isolation. Absolutely. Will, I love your passion for this and your passion to help others. Uh, CTA family and listeners checking this podcast out. Also check out our website at compete training academy.org. We have a fundraiser going on for the compete training foundation to support families in adverse situations Right now, we have three uh, TBI patients, traumatic brain injury patients that uh, we are working with at Compete Training Academy that have been through some very serious accidents um, that people don't understand how much uh, adversity and cost and the, the, the battle that it is to come back from a traumatic brain injury. Uh, my wife, Courtney, uh, she is uh, putting together a 
uh, golf outing, a few golf outings and fundraisers that are coming out. Uh, so go to our website, competetrainingacademy.org. There is a tab there for uh, the fundraiser and the golf outing that you can go check out there as well. Uh, and Will, uh, just to close here, man, can't wait to see you on the court. I'm thankful uh, for you, and man. And I know here uh, in a couple of days, actually, you're going to get back here to the States, and I'm excited to get back on the court with you. Watch out, Boiler Nation, for my man, Will Berg. He's uh, got a very bright future and uh, can't wait to see what's in store for him. Will, thanks for again for joining us today on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. CTA family, always remember that competing is doing what God calls you to do, even when it's hard. Thank you.